How many know that there's power in God? Yes. Amen. Oh, yes. Yes. Yes, in the name of Jesus. Amen. Great. Give us one second. <laughs> Amen. God is good. Oh, yes, yes he, he is. is. He is awesome. Yes. Amen. Amen. Oh, yes. There is power in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. There is power in the name of Jesus. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Break every chain, break every chain, break every chain. Amen. There's power in the name of Jesus. Oh, yes, it is. There is power in the name of Jesus. Oh, yes. There is power in the name of Jesus. Break every chain, 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 break every chain. I'm rising up. Break every chain, break every chain. Hallelujah. I bring you the chains for me. Yes. Do you hear the chains for Yes. I hear the chains for Ah! Uh -huh. 
falling. Yay, God. Hear those chains falling. Means somebody's being set free. Means life is changing. Means God is moving. We hear the chains falling this morning. Father, we thank you today. Because in the spirit, we hear the chains falling. Devil tried to bind up some people, but you're setting folks free, God. And we are so grateful this morning, Lord. We're so grateful for what you're doing, Lord, even in your house right now. We're so grateful for how the spirit is moving amongst your people today. God, have your way today. Have your way today, Lord. We have come today, Lord, to worship you. We've come, Lord, to lift you up. We've come to hear a word from you. And we ask, Lord, again, that your spirit would do whatever he wants to do in this house today. That he would move according to his will for his people. Pray that you would have your way in us now, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. We bless you, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you give God some praise today? Amen. 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 He's worthy to be praised today. He's worthy to be magnified today. He's worthy to be honored in his house today. I love that song that they sang, that second song. What's the name of that second song again, Sister Deborah? It's already getting better, yes. It's already getting better. He's already making it easier. He's already moving for me. For me, for me, for me. Let me tell you, can I, can I give you my testimony this morning? Let me tell you something. I went to work last night and it's always uh, difficult for me to go to work on Saturday night because I always know I got to work 12 hours and then I got to come and worship the Lord. And the, the worshiping the Lord is never difficult. But as I, I went to work last night and my back was bothering me some. And so when I went, I had worked Friday night and I usually when you work the night before you get the same assignment. So I kind of knew what I was in store for the night before I had three babies, three crying little boys that just did not want to, they didn't want to just rest. They wanted to be loud and, you know, you know we handled it. We did what we had to do. And when I went back last night, um, one of the little boys, um, well, they had changed my assignments. So I was only going to have two. I said, okay, well, we can do this. And when I got in the report room, they said, well, you're only going to have one because the one we got to transfer to U of M because he was having some issues. So I said, okay. And then they said, you're going to be first admit, which means... I'm waiting for the next patient to walk through the door and I have to admit him. And I said to the Lord, I, I always pray on my way to work. Lord, whatever you got for me tonight, let me do it with honor. Let me do it to your glory. And so um, when they said that, I said, oh, Lord. You know, I said, I, I don't. I said, Lord, you know, I always tell the Lord, I don't mean to be selfish. And I always tell God, your will is ultimately what I want. But you told me to ask. And so I said, God, if, if it's not absolutely necessary would you just please, Lord, we don't, we don't, if we don't have to get a baby, could we just not get a baby tonight? And, <laughs> and so I had, because they said, you only going to have the one baby. And you, you know, so I'm like, okay. And I always go over my sermon on Saturday night, whether I'm at home or at work. And so I said, you know, this, if I don't, you know, I got this one, I'll just kind of read in between and do my work. But let me tell you something. When, it, when that song, they start singing that song, I said, just for me. He did it just for me. We, we didn't even have one delivery last night. Not even one. I am so grateful. So grateful. And when I got off this morning, my back was really bothering me. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm going to do what I got to do. But when Sister Deborah said, y'all lean, your you stretch your hands toward pastor and we prayed, I felt the relief. I felt the relief. I felt the relief. I am so grateful. I felt the relief. And I, I just, I said, Lord, you did it just for me. Just for me, God. See, I know, I know the God that we serve. Or at least I know the God I serve. I know he's a real God, and I know he answers prayer. I, I just love him for that. I'm reminded that he said, if you walk up right before me, there's no good thing that I'll withhold from you. And I'm grateful. Sister Jackie mentioned about her great nephew, little Mr. Wayne, my little friend. He met me at the door this morning. He's my little buddy. And we've been hanging today. And uh, he's going, I guess he's going to stay in the sanctuary. I see him in the back. Y'all pray for Wayne. We want God's hand to be on little Mr. Wayne. Amen. God's got some things in store for that little fella. 
And I believe, I've, I've said it before, when we dedicate babies, that it takes a village. And we are the village, all right? And we are a family. And I'm going to say this, and uh, I, I think I'll be all right, but let me just say this. Wayne's mom is in a place right now that, let's just say she needs prayer. And so we're going to hold her up in prayer. And while we're doing that, we're going to hold a little man up in prayer. All right? When you see him, you love on him. Now, he gets plenty of love because his grandma is, is Sister Sonora, and she loves him to death, and his great aunt is Sister Jackie over here. But let's let him know that he has a family at Lighthouse that loves him. All right? All right. Amen. Amen. God bless. God bless. Well, it's time for the word. Um, Let's get to what God is having to say to us today. I, I want to say something else first. You see my shirt I have on? I don't know if y'all can read it from as far as you are, but it says on here, uh, normal's not coming back. Jesus is. Yes. I, as I thought about this, I, I, you know, because I, I, I got it for Christmas and I wear it different times and I always think about what it says. I'm careful about what I put on my body to wear because I don't want folks reading something that's not godly on my body anyway. Um, but I, I know, we're, we're, you know, we've been in a time, this, this, the pandemic and all the stuff going on, and people are like, you know, when are we going back to normal? We're not going back to normal, folks. It's not coming back. But what we as believers need to be doing is preparing for the comeback of Jesus because he is coming back. And the Bible says he's coming back for a church without a spot or a wrinkle. That's actually a song, but the scripture is still the same. We can't, he does, he's not looking for a church with blemishes and spots. And what that means is he's looking for people whose hearts are turned toward him. He's looking for a body of believers because believe it or not, we are the church. He's looking for some folks that will love him, that will honor him, that will show his glory in the earth. He's looking for some folks who reflect him. Amen? Amen. So, so when he comes back, I, I, will he find a faithful people? We need to ask ourselves that. Will he find a faithful person in me? Yeah. Will I be who he's looking for? Because if you're not who he's looking for, guess what? You ain't going with him. Amen. And there's no, you know, we can, we can sugarcoat it. We can make it sweet. Y'all know I'm not a sugarcoater. I love you to death, but I got to tell you the truth. Because God told me I have to tell you the truth. So, so let's make sure we're getting ready for the return of Jesus, because normal's not coming back. Amen? Amen. All right. So this morning, um, I have a word from God for the people of God, and I'm one of those people, so I got a word for me too. Uh, according to the prophet Ezekiel, in the book of Ezekiel, he says that God gives us a new heart. That's Ezekiel 36, 26, for those of you that will be on Bible study tomorrow, so we can talk about these things. He says this, a new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's what God says to Ezekiel. He was talking specifically to the children of Israel because they had gone out and had done some terrible things, had been, you know, people like today doing them. And God would say, I don't want you to do that. I want you to love me. I want you to serve me. I want you to walk with me. And as long as you do that, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you everything you need. And they would say, yes, God, you're right. You're absolutely right. And as soon as they said, you're absolutely right, they went back and started doing what they wanted to do. And God had gotten tired of them. And he had, he had banished them. They had gone to Babylon for captivity. And, and, and now he's telling them, I'm going to bring you back. I'm going to gather you back. Even though you haven't done what you were supposed to do, be, I love you. And I want to show folk that you are mine. You belong to me. And that's when he told him, I'm going to give you a new heart. Well, for us today, when we talk about a new heart, this happened. The moment you gave your heart to Christ, the moment you said, I'm a sinner, but I don't want to be a sinner anymore. I want to give my heart to Christ. I want to accept him into my life. The moment you did that, the Bible tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, it tells us that we have been made a new creature. It said everything old is passed away. Every, we are made brand new. And that happened the moment I gave my heart to Jesus. Because when I'm in Christ, like Paul says, I become a new creature. Brand new. That happened immediately. And that's the first step of the transformation process in our lives. We all go through that. Now the next step of the process is what I want to talk to you about today. And that is being transformed 
by God. Being transformed by God. We've been talking this year about purpose and power. And some folk think I left that, you know, but I haven't left it just because the sermon doesn't say that in the title. We're still talking about purpose and power. And God's purpose for me, for you, is that we would be transformed by the power of his Holy Spirit. That is his purpose for every single one of us as believers. All right? So that word transformed, you see it on the screen, transformed. It, it, it comes from, a, a, the, the Greek word that it comes from is metamorpho. And that's where we get the word metamorphosis from. It, it means a, a, a change of a physical form, a change of structure, or a change of substance, especially by a supernatural means. It's an alteration in appearance of character or circumstance. When we think about the word metamorphosis, it's a word we use when we describe how a caterpillar goes into a cocoon and, and is transformed and out comes this beautiful butterfly. You wouldn't even know when you see, you know, because I, I think my sister B, who does not like caterpillars, that is not her thing. But I think she would like the butterfly that comes out of the cocoon. Just don't let me bother be bothered by the caterpillar. But the caterpillars are usually furry looking and kind of ugly and they crawl on the ground. And a lot of people that's just, ew, don't like that. But when that beautiful monarch butterfly and those different color butterflies come out, they are beautiful creatures. But they have gone through a metamorphosis. The only difference in what they go through and what we go through is that our change starts on the inside. And it's a part of the transformation process that takes place in our mind. We renew our minds, and that's what we're going to talk about today. Our ugly, sinful, and selfish person becomes like Jesus. That's what happens. All right? So the mind. We're going to talk about the mind today. Our mind. Our powerful, complicated crazy mind it's our understanding it's the seed of our understanding the seed of our intelligence this is our reasoning process our mind is the doorway into who we are did you know that all right our mind is the area of most consistent attack by the enemy by the devil himself our minds are very powerful so much of what we do starts right here. Sin starts right here. You don't go out and sin unless you've, you know, you've thought about it. It's kind of, you know, it starts as a little small thought in it, and you keep dwelling on it, it keeps getting bigger and bigger, and then you go out and commit it. Crime starts in the mind. You start thinking, you know, folks who steal or whatever, they're thinking, I need that or I want that, and so I, it's not mine, but I'm going to just go get it. That, it. It started, you know, you start thinking about it here. Deceit starts in the mind. You start thinking about, you know, some, some shifty things that you want to do. Doubt starts in the mind. The devil tells you, you know, you, if, when it comes to God, God can do everything. And you start, you know, like he did with Eve. Did he really say not to eat that fruit of that tree? You, you sure that's what he said? And then you start second guessing and, well, you know what? May, maybe I misunderstood. Maybe I got it wrong misunderstandings start in the mind we start thinking I said it last week about how we think you know we get paranoid and we think folks after us and they want to do something to us and misunderstand we hear a word it doesn't sound right and then we get it all twisted up and before we know it we got a big problem Satan loves to attack the thought lives or the minds of believers he batters Christians or believers with thoughts of fear and anxiety and worry and sickness defeat and even death these are some of those giants we talked about just last Sunday. Most of those giants, if you go back and you look at the list, if you wrote it down, or if you think about some of, the, some of the giants we named last week, most of them start right here, right here. Research has shown that your belief patterns, the things that you believe and that you, you believe are truth, they started or they, they're formed in your mind. Every time you think about a certain belief or, or something, you know, you, it, it's a way of doing things, a way of processing. It, 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 it creates in your head an electrical impulse that goes across your brain. They have done research to show. 
And every time you have that thought again, it creates what they call a rut in your brain. And over time, a mindset is formed. When my husband was sick, he was at the VA hospital downtown. And I went down there pretty much every day, and sometimes twice a day, sometimes three times a day, depending on what was going on. And I used to tell folks, my car could probably go by itself. Because I had gone that way, you know, leave out of here, go get on 96, go down 96, switch over some kind of way, get to 94, and then come off at whatever street that was and go to the hospital. I could do it without even thinking about it because it was just, it was a mindset. It was what, it was what I did. The ruts were formed. Um, there, there's a, I can't even remember the town as I was reading this. It was saying that in certain town, I can't remember now, but in certain seasons, it's, it's wet and the roads get really muddy and it causes deep ruts, you know, from your tires. And it said in that town, pick your rut before you get in it because you're going to be in it for a long time because your car going to be stuck in it. And that's what happens to us. We get a certain mindset and we get stuck in it. And I don't care what people say. I don't care how they do. You go your way, that's okay because this is me. I'm doing me. This, this, is how, this is how I roll. This is how I've been doing for a long time. And when people have learned something over and over and over again, like you're being taught by the world and the world's way of thinking, you know, you, it's, it's been that way. You've been programmed that way. This is what we do. This is in my family. This is what we did. In, in my, the group I run with, this is how we did it. This, this is what we said. This is what we thought. This is, it didn't matter if it was right or wrong. This is what we did. And so when we come to Jesus, we come with that mindset. Some of us like to think that, you know, when I got saved... I woke up one day and I just decided to follow Jesus and I'm all in. No, that's not how it works. That's not how it works at all. When I come to Christ, first of all, he doesn't draw me. I think I said that last week. If the Holy Spirit doesn't draw me, I don't come. I only come to Jesus because his spirit draws me. But once his spirit draws me and I make the decision by grace through faith to accept him as my savior, that's the first part of the process. That's the, probably the easier part of the process. The difficult part of the process comes when I got to get my mind renewed. When I got to start making changes because I'm set in what I know. I'm set in what I think. I'm set in how I do things. And if I don't allow the Holy Spirit to begin to make some changes in the way I think in my mindset, I'm not going to start doing what God tells me to do. Because in my mind and even in my heart, I'm believing that this is right or this is the way it's supposed to be done. Some of us, we would say, well, that's what my mama taught me. That's what my grandmama taught me. Can I tell you something today? And please don't get me beat up. Sometime mama was wrong. Yeah, I know. Let me duck down. <laughs> Some, because see mama's mama was wrong could have been I mean we have to entertain that thought sometime daddy was wrong he thought he was right because he was telling you what he knew but sometime that was wrong and we have to at least entertain the thought that perhaps what I'm thinking is not right and so let me, let me read the text to you today. I, I got ahead of myself. I should have read it first. But let me read the text to you. This is, this is from Paul in the book of Romans, chapter 12. And it's a familiar passage, um, verses 1 and 2. And he says, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Being transformed by God. Yeah. Change comes for a believer when he or she begins to believe what the Bible says about who we are. Who we are in God, who God is himself, and how God moves or wants to move in our lives and in the world. Our behavior or our life will change when our thinking changes. Sadly to say, there's some folk who've been saved a long time, but they are carnal Christians 
which means they are worldly Christians or they are baby Christians. They have not matured in Christ. And the reason they have not matured in Christ, the reason they are still worldly minded is because they still thinking with a worldly mind. Uh, uh, to have, we, God wants us to be spiritually minded. Now when we talk about being spiritually minded, it's more than just thinking uh, about heaven. You know, I just sit up and think about how beautiful heaven's going to be. The pearly gates and the streets of gold and this and that and the other. That's not what we're talking about. Being spiritually minded means not allowing your mind to be swayed by circumstances or doubtful thoughts and putting your mind under submission to the word of God. So maybe you, you don't understand why you should have your mind transformed. You, Pastor, I don't even understand. I mean, what, what's the big deal? I, don't, I mean, because what's wrong with the way I saw it? Well, to you, it's nothing wrong with it. But we're not talking about what you and I think. We're talking about what does God say? And so when you think about why should I be transformed, you talk about being transformed. Why should I be transformed? Can I just tell you a few things about being transformed? One is because of all he's done for you. All of the things God has done for you, don't you think he has a right to tell you how you're supposed to think? Y'all yeah. kind of quiet today, and I'm the one stayed up all night. <laughs> yeah, because of all he's done for you. You were bought with a price. You are not your own. You did not save yourself. You did not die for yourself. Jesus Christ did. And that gives him a right to expect certain things. And he says, I want your mind transformed. Because this is what God says is acceptable. When you read the text, this is what God finds acceptable is a renewed mind. Because this is what true worship is. And I'm going to talk about that in just a moment. Because this is how we learn to know and understand what the will of God is for us. People always talk about they want to know what God's will is for them. How do I know the will of God? Well, first of all, you got to have your mind transformed. Because if you've got a carnal mind, if you've got a worldly mind, you're not going to know the will of God. You won't accept it anyway. It'll be foolishness to you. So now let's get into what we want to talk about today. Do you want to be transformed today? Let me ask that question first because maybe I'm in the wrong room. Yes. You really want to be transformed today? Yes. Okay, then let's, let's, let's see what Paul has to say about us being transformed. These are the words of Paul in, in Romans. He, he's the one that's talking here. He's talking to the church at Rome, wanting them to be changed in how they think. Because, you know, Rome was a place, you know, they, they, they were different kind of people. They were a proud people. They, were a, they had money in Rome. They did what they wanted to do in Rome. You know, hear that? When you're in Rome, do as the Romans do, that kind of stuff. They did them. And Paul said, no, don't make, I, don't, I want y'all to learn some things. Y'all need to change some things. And so he's talking to them. He's been talking to them throughout the whole text of Romans. And as I tell you always, go home and read it. Go home and take your time and read it. And if you say, I ain't got time to read it all, read at least chapter 11, okay? So, chapter 11 and then chapter 12. So number one, Paul says, if you really want to be transformed by God, number one, you got to give your whole self to God. Thank you, brother. Give your whole self to God. Anybody here, you hear me what I'm telling you? Give your whole self to God. Thank you. Not a part of you, not a piece of you. Keith says, I want all of you. When you look at the text in chapter 1, I mean chapter 12, verse 1, Paul says, I plead with you to give your bodies. Now you'll say, why is he pleading? What is the point? What, what is Paul? When you think about somebody pleading, I mean, they are sincerely telling you this is what you need to do. He didn't just in a moment in passing by say, oh yeah, you know what? You probably should give your life to Jesus. No, he was pleading. I can see Paul almost on his knees like somebody who knows that this is most important. This is what you sincerely need to do but you say Paul why do I need to do that Paul says because of the mercy and the grace and the love that God has shown toward each of us we ought to give our lives to him we ought to give him everything we've got when you read chapter 11 alone Paul is talking to them about the mercy of God but if you go all the way from the beginning of Romans all the way up Paul is talking to them about the, the sacrifice that Christ has made for them about how lo the Lord loved them even in their sin how they deserve death how they ought not to be where they are but because of the mercy and the grace and the kindness and the love of God he said he had mercy on you you should have been dead you should have been in hell you should never have had a chance but God he had mercy on them. And so he said, based on what Jesus Christ did for you, based on what God the Father did for each one of us, the least you can do 
That's your reasonable service. That's what the King James says. It's your reasonable service. It's the least you could do based on what he did for you. See, because he wants to, he, it's the, when we give our lives to God, see, many of us, we got the wrong mindset again. I got to give God my life. He going to take everything from me. I ain't going to be able to do what I want to do because you're thinking with a carnal mind. You're thinking with a worldly mind. So yes, you're going to think like that. What you don't realize is when you give everything you got to God, he gives you more than you ever gave him. He's got more for you than what you, that little bit of stuff you gave up, that little raggedy life you gave to him. He takes it and changes it and molds it and shapes it and makes something beautiful out of it. So he said the least thing you can do is give me yourself. And, and, if, and if you look in, in verse 36, I don't have a slide for them. Chapter 11, verse 36, he says, for everything comes from him. He's talking about God. And it exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Everything comes from God. Everything comes from God. And everything exists by his power. You only hear because of the power of God. You only hear because God gave you a life to be here with. And everything is intended for his glory. We forget. You remember we talked about all the way back. We talked about Jeremiah at the beginning of the year. We were created to worship God. We were created for God's purpose. We were created to be God's servant. Everything I got belongs to God. And he said, based on that, you ought to give him your whole self. Based on what God has done for you. Sometimes we ought to step back and just take a look at and count all of the different things God has given us. How he has blessed us. We used to sing a song, count your blessings. Y'all heard me talk about that before. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. When I've had people that say, God ain't never done nothing for me. I want to step back because I think lightning is fixing to strike them. But I have told them, I have challenged them. Okay, I want you to sit down. I want you to write down all the different things you got in your life. And then you take a look at it. And if you can't find anything in there, first of all, something wrong with you. But if you can't find nothing there, do this. <sighs> and tell me whose air did you just breathe in? Who did it? Every time you walk across it like this. Even if, you, you know, if you're walking with a little limp. Even if you're dragging along, whose legs you walk, who gave you the legs you got? Every time you speak a word, who gave you the voice? Every time you look out, even if you got glasses on, who gave you the eyes you got? Do you think you gave them to yourself? No. God did it. And so it's the least we could do to say, God, I'm grateful. And if you want me, I'm going to give you me. Because it ain't a lot. You know, I ain't, you know, some of us, we think a little bit too much of ourselves. And Paul says it. Uh, Write down in the same text. Don't think too highly of yourself. Amen. See, we do that. But if we really looked at our lives without God, our poor little raggedy lives, it'd be like, Lord, you, you, you want me? You want this? I, ooh, take it. That's what we ought to be saying. But he said, I want all of you. I want all of you. See, we, we think we give God what we want to give God. But he says, give your bodies to God, first of all, because of all he's done for you. But then he said, let them be a living and a holy sacrifice. He wants your living sacrifice. That's you. He wants it to be a holy sacrifice, a set apart sacrifice. When you look at sacrifices in the Old Testament, the animals that they would bring, they would be live when they brought them, but then they would kill them. But they had to be perfect. They couldn't have blemishes. They couldn't be spotted. They couldn't be messed up. And, and so when God, he, he wants us to bring us to him. And he basically is saying to you, I want you to offer yourself to me. I want you to bring and present yourself to me. Don't, don't make me have to come and get you and drag you. Because he, he, he could do that. But he said, no, I want you to come happily. And, and you bring me a present. You bring me you. And you offer it to me. And you say, daddy, here I am. Take my life. Do whatever you want to do with it, God. And so when he says offer it, see, a sacrifice, first of all, it's going to cost. A sacrifice, that's what a sacrifice means. It costs. And so he wants you. It's going to cost, but he wants you. He wants all of you. And, and, and we, re we read it before. It's a part of the Ten Commandments that, that we are to love God with all of our heart, mind, soul, body, strength. Now, he tells us present your bodies. And some people say, well, he wants my physical body. Well, yes, he wants that too. But when they talk about body in the scripture, it's talking about all of you. 
He wants all of you. He wants your mind. He wants your, 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 your resources. He wants your time. He wants your strength. He wants all that you got to give him. He wants it. And he wants it a living sacrifice. And, and he wants it to be continuously. He wants it to be daily. He wants it to be, he doesn't want you to say, well, I gave it to you one time. God, ain't that enough? No, he wants you to be, a, it's supposed to be a continuous sacrifice that you don't give it and pull it back. You say it's yours, God. A living sacrifice. And can I tell you, God's not a junkyard. You see, when you go to the junkyard, like if you got a car and, and it's, it's broken down, don't nobody else want it, you can sell the parts. You could take the parts of this place and the parts of this place. But see, that's not God. God's not a junkyard. He don't want parts. He wants the whole you. All of you. He wants you to present yourself to him. So that's number one. You got to give your whole self to God. I'm telling somebody today, stop offering God pieces and parts of you. He said, I want all of you. Don't worry about what you think about. Bring it to me because I got a plan. Okay? So you got that part. This is, this is the process of being transformed. It's got to start with you, with you giving God all of you. All right? Number two. Y'all kind of quiet now. Number two. Paul says, you want to be transformed? He said, don't be like the world. Uh-oh. He says, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. Lord help us. Stop copying the behaviors and the lifestyles of this world. That's what the customs are. Stop it. Don't do it anymore. Too many believers look like unbelievers. Look like them. Sound like them. Dress like them. Talk like them. Walk like them, behave like them. And God said, I want you to stop it. I don't want you doing that. We are not supposed to be a copy of the world. We are not supposed to, some texts say, don't conform. And the king, be not conformed to the world. The word conform means to be compliant with or to fit. We are not supposed to fit in the world. Why do we keep trying to do it? Why do we keep trying to mimic what the world has? Are we saying to God that what you have for us, God, is not good enough? Oh, Lord, y'all done, either y'all done went to sleep or y'all done fell out. Something done happened out there. If I didn't see you sitting up, I, if it was dark in here, I think y'all had left. People of God, we are people of God. Amen. Aren't we? Isn't that what we're supposed? Isn't that what we call? Yes. Amen? Amen. So God doesn't look like the world, does He? No, no He doesn't. So should His people look like the world? No. Uh-uh. Should His people have the same language that the world has? No. Should His people have the same dress as the world has? We done really got crazy with that. Amen. Whew, Lord, help us. I ain't looking at nobody. Looking at the screen on the back wall. That's what I'm doing. Looking at the screen on the back wall. Looking at the screen. Now, I'm not talking because I you know, I'm not going at y'all. I told y'all, I'm not finna give you no list. Don't do this. Don't do this. Do this. Do this. Do this. Do this. But we're not, but this ain't my, this is not me talking. This is the word of God. Amen. Don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world. We are in the world, but we are not of the world. Amen. We're supposed to be different. Can I take you all the way back to the Old Testament? When I was, you know, looking at it over again, and I knew because I've looked at it before, but I just, you know, just getting my mindset ready, and I'm reading some stuff about it, and, and well, Peter is the one that said we're supposed to be a peculiar people. But when you go all the way back to the Old Testament, when, when the children of Israel were about to go into the promised land, 
the Can land of Canaan, the place that God had promised to take them into. Moses, you know, God and Moses had, had a few conversations about what they were supposed to be doing. And so basically, and I'm paraphrasing, Moses said, come on in here, y'all. Like, like y'all sitting here today, come on here, I got to talk to you. You know how we have sometimes, we say, I said, Lighthouse, we need to have a family meeting after service. The guests go home and y'all be here. And we sit down and we talk about home stuff. Basically, Moses said, let me tell y'all something, because I know y'all. Y'all hard-headed. You like to do you. But can I tell you what God said? And then he proceeded to tell them. Now we about, you know, you know how we used to, they don't do this no more, but you remember how parents used to have these talks with your children? We finna go into this store. If you get in this store and act a fool, I'm finna, I'm gonna deal with you. Don't go in here begging for nothing. You already ate. I'm not buying nothing. We're going here, look at some stuff. We're gonna come out. That's what you used to, that kind of stuff, right? And so he said to them, basically, listen, I know y'all. I know some of y'all, y'all on the edge already. Y'all kind of teetering, y'all. It's hard for y'all, but I'm telling you, we are not like the people where we're going. We're not supposed to be like them. We're going into heathen territory. These people are heathen. Now, God already said he's going to wipe them out for us. Because the Israel was a small tribe. They wasn't the biggest. God said, I didn't choose you because you were big. You, you small. You're one of the smallest tribes out there. But I'm going to take you into this land, and I'm going to clear out all these heathen folks for you. But he said, when you go into the land, I want you to go in there like you've got some sense. I want you to go in there like you my people. I want you to go in there like you had home training. I don't want you going in there and become like them. I don't want to look up and you be wearing the stuff that they wearing. I don't want to look up and find out you worshiping the gods that they worshiping. I don't want to look up and find out you marrying folks you ain't got no business. That's not what I'm talking about here, but I'm talking about taking on the customs of the foreign land. He said, that's not the way my people behave. That's not what we do. Y'all serve me. I'm your daddy. I tell you how you're going to dress. I tell you what you're going to do. I tell you how you're going to worship. If you got any questions, come and ask me. But do not go into this land and become like them. When they look at you, I want them to know you belong to me. I don't want them saying, well, I can't remember if you Israelite or if you um, Gergeshite or if you, oh, let me see, you Philistine. What? Let me see. I don't even remember. I don't know what you, because you, you kind of look like them. I can't tell you from them. Not to be so. Not to be so. If we're peculiar, and see, that's our trouble. We don't want to be peculiar. Well, if you don't want to be peculiar, you better step on over there with them. Because God said, my people are different. My people do what I tell them to. My people look like me. My people talk like me. My people behave like me. They don't behave like the world. And so I'm telling you today, stop copying the behaviors and the lifestyle of the world. When we talk about the customs, it's the habits and the patterns, it's and the behaviors and the functions and the operation. The way we conduct ourselves is not supposed to be the same as how the world conducts itself. We are not supposed to be like that. We're not supposed to be allowing the world to shape us and give us our thoughts and our patterns and our behaviors. We got it backwards. And see, when we came out, and this is the last part I'm going to talk about, but, the, but when we came out of the world, we stepped out of the darkness and into the light. And we came out of worldliness, and now we've stepped over into godliness. And if I'm going to still behave like that, I have to admit, something wrong with me. That's what, that's what you, you step, something wrong with me, y'all. Just, just tell it out loud so everybody can hear it. This is not the way the children of God behave. Uh, something wrong with me, y'all, so make it loud so they know. Because when you think about, when you, when you hear people talking about the church today, it's sad. It's sad. Well, if that's what Jesus is like, I don't think I want to be like that. Because y'all don't look no different from me. They cussing as much as I'm cussing. Oh, Jesus. They gossip more than the people in the world. Whoops. They running around on their husbands and their wives like folks in the world. Uh-oh. Did you know the divorce rate in the church is right on par with the world? I don't like your behavior, so I'm going to divorce you. I, 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 ain't, got to, I ain't got to take this no more. Because that's what the world says. If I don't like you no more, get rid of you and get another one. Do you know that God hates divorce? That's what the word says. I didn't say it. Matter of fact, Jesus said it in the Sermon on the Mount. 
He said it. See, can I, can I tell you who you're supposed to be patterning your life after? If you turn in your Bible to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2, and I'm just going to read it. You've probably heard it read before. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8 says, you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. That's number one. Your attitude, your mindset is supposed to be the same as Jesus. Though he was God, because he and God are one and the same, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. In other words, it didn't give him the big head. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave. I know I lost somebody right there. Uh-uh, Pastor, I, <laughs> a slave, you. And was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. If you want to know the kind of attitude that Christ Jesus had, go back and read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Look at his life when he walked on the earth. Look at what kind of person he was. Look at how he dealt with people. Look at what he did when folks reviled him, when people lied on him, when people did things to him. Look at how he would respond when people would try to ask him difficult questions. Look and see what Jesus said we ought to be like. Look and see how he lived his life. Now please let me tell you something. He wasn't a stuck up church person. I, put it, I tell you that. He was free. But, but see, because I don't, I don't want to make a bunch of um, legalistic church people. We've had enough of that. We need some people that are free in the Lord, who live their lives free in Christ. But people who are different in their attitude and in their mindsets and how they deal with people. Because Jesus said if they slap you on one cheek, turn the other one to them. I know some folk ready to leave here now. He said, if they want your cloak or your, your shirt, give them your coat too. If they tell you to go one mile, go two. In other words, he's telling, because see, th we've talked about this before. There won't be any good people in, he in heaven. There'll be godly people, okay? But there are a lot of good people in the world that are showing up a lot of godly people. And what he's telling them, he told them in another place, unless your, your, your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees, those, those people who were stuck in tradition and only want, you know, you have to do it just like this. If you don't do it just like this, you're going to fall off. No, he said, unless you live a life that's better than that, you need not think you've done anything special. Uh-uh. He said, do be more than just a good person. Be a godly person. Go above and beyond. That's, that's the attitude and the mindset of Jesus Christ. And, and, and every time he said it, folks was like, what? Huh? Yeah, that, that's, that's the way we're supposed to be. That's the attitude we're supposed to have. That's the mindset we're supposed to have. So that when we're dealing with people, when we're walking through life, when we're going to work, when we're going to the, to the market, when we're strolling through the neighborhood, people know that we're different. They know it by the way we talk. They know it by the way we live. They know it by the way we look. They know it how we, because we, we handle situations in a godly way. Amen? Amen? So you can't be like the world. Now the last one. Paul said, if you want to be transformed, he said, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Your mind has got to be renewed. You got to understand and make the statement to yourself that my old way of thinking is jacked up. I heard Sister Mimi say, mm, that's it. See, I, I got to understand that when I came to Jesus, I came out of the world. Remember that? I was unsaved. I was dead. But he made me alive. He made me new. When I came, my heart was made new. 
But he allowed me to bring with me my new heart. He allowed me to bring my raggedy mind. Because he didn't change that like that. That is a process. That's what we call spiritual maturity. As I grow up in Christ, my mind is being changed. Now, please, please, please don't be talking about I'm still at 20 years I've been saved and I'm still talking the same way I did and I'm still walking the same way I did because, Pastor, you know, I'm in process and my mind being, my mind being changed. Um, hello? If you're still talking the same way you did and you're still walking the same way you did, the renewal process has not been going on. Because every day that I'm walking with Jesus, every day that I'm living with Jesus, I am being transformed. And every day I get a little bit closer to him and a little bit more like him. Every day as I'm allowing my mind to be transformed. I can't say I've been, I've been saved for 20 years and my mind is the same as it was when I came to Christ. Something is wrong. Something is definitely wrong. See, got to allow God to completely change my mind. I don't get to change. Well, Lord, now, wait a minute, Lord. What you, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, God. What you going to change? Which part of my thinking you going to change? All of it, hopefully. All of it. Because all of it needs to be changed. If I'm in Christ and I say I got the same mind that I had when I got saved, when I, when I came to Jesus, I got the same mind, then you have not grown. You've not grown. And it's evident by how we react, how we deal with situations, how we handle ourselves in, in difficult places. Sometimes it, it shows up in the language that we use. Some of us can cuss people out without using cuss words. You know that, right? We can tell you off in a heartbeat because our attitude and our neck will tell you some things. <laughs> oh, yeah, we can do it. You can say, I don't cuss. Well, you may not cuss, but you cut. <laughs> okay, so you, you got to know that. We can cut you up and walk away and you, you know, you be sliced and diced and you don't even know it. And then we walk away and say, hallelujah, praise the Lord. <laughs> yeah, that's what we do. Your mind ain't been changed enough. Not See, because unless your change, your, your, excuse me, unless your, your thinking changes, your behavior won't change. Amen. And that, that's what's wrong with it. This, this, well, how come I can't do it? Well, what's wrong with the way I said that? I don't, I, don't, I don't see nothing wrong with it. He said, let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. It's not about what you think is wrong. It's what does God say? He said, I came to change you. Because see, the old you, though I loved you like you were, I need to transform you so you can reflect Christ. And, and see, some of us, we need to honestly ask ourselves, would the way I talk, would the way I act, with the way my mind, the way I think about things, would that reflect Christ? I mean, I mean be honest. I mean, you don't have to answer us, you know. Ask God, Lord, does my thinking reflect you? What kind of mind am I thinking with, God? Is it a godly mind? Is it a worldly mind? Is it a rot gut mind? Y'all know what I'm talking about. What kind of mind do I have, God? Your life is not going to change until your thinking is changed. How you think about situations, how you think about circumstances, how you deal with stuff. We, we talk about, like I said, so many things start in the mind. I think it was James. I think it was James. They talked about if you, no, 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 it was, it was Jesus. If you, if you look on a woman to lust, or a man, he used a woman, but if you look on a man to lust or a woman to lust, and you start thinking about that, You've already done it in your heart. You've already done it. It's already, see, because God's looking at the inside of you. And, and so God needs to come in and change how you think, how you process stuff. If you're the kind of person that, that in your old life, you were a schemer or a conniver, and, and that's the way you still, when you're looking at stuff, you're trying to figure out how you can get over, you're trying to figure out how you can, you know, how I can fix this thing, your thinking needs to be changed. 
If, if, if people, you know, we, people are talking to you and you in your mind are thinking about what you're going to say to them, how you, oh, I got, ooh, I'm, ooh, when I get to, ooh, Lord, I'm going to get to, ooh, wait. Your thinking needs to be changed. Amen. If you're cutting folks up like a salad, <laughs> your thinking has got to change. Because what I got to keep thinking about is I'm supposed to reflect Christ in the earth. And if my thinking doesn't change, I'm only reflecting me. And God said, that's not it, baby. You, you're not God. I'm God. I don't need another God. I got Jesus. We, we, we got this. Your thinking's got to change. I'm just, oh Lord, help me. You got to say to God, see this, this is why I got to present myself to God. A living sacrifice. And I got to admit some things. See, I, I got to be honest with God. You know, we, we, we so good about putting on the mask. And we so good. Well, basically, we just good at lying to people about how we really are, what's really going on with us and what's happening, who I am really. We, we, we lie to ourselves. We lie to each other. God said, you know what? Them little lies you're telling, they don't mean nothing to me because I see the real you. I see who you are when nobody is looking. I see you. And so God wants us, we talk about presenting our bodies. God wants me to come to him and bring myself and say, God, I am in a mess. My mind is tangled up because I think wrong things are right things. See, this is why we got to come out of the world because the world says it's okay to do some underhanded things as long as you don't hurt nobody. It's okay to, to sleep with somebody you're not married to as long as y'all grown because y'all two grown people and as long as y'all consenting adults. It's okay. It's okay to undress somebody with your eyes as long as you don't touch them, as long as you don't put your hand. You know, it's okay because they don't know nothing about it. It's okay. That's what the world says. The world says is you ain't got to love everybody that ain't even possible the world says it ain't possible for you to love everybody because people do you wrong but the bible says no you no 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 see god's way of thinking is totally opposite of the world's way and until god transforms how we think we still thinking with the wrong mind and we can't be who god wants us to be because my mind has not been changed that's why we have so much messiness in the church. And I don't mean lighthouse. I'm, I'm talking church in general. Because we coming into church. We all coming here. I just use it. We all come into this church. Now we ain't got a mega church. So we ain't got thousands of people. But the people we got. We come in here with all our different ways of thinking. With all our different mindsets. And I grew up like this. And my mama said we did it this way. Well my, my mama told me this is how we going to do this. Well my daddy said this is what we do. My mama said if somebody hit you you better fight. And you better not come back here. When, you better not come back here to when they beat me up. Because you better fight. If you got to fall all down on the ground, they got to take you. You fight to the death if that's what you got to do. Because that's what my mama said. And somebody else said, well, no, my mama said run. Because you just get out the way, live to die another day. But we got all this up in here together. And we trying to come together and become one. That's what the Bible tells us to be. Become one. Be unified. Now, not uniform, but unified. But as long as you think it with your mind and you think it with your mind, I'm thinking with my mind, ain't none of us got the mind of God. We can't come together. Amen. We can't get things done that God said get done in my name. Amen. And again, we're giving God a bad name in the world. Because again, people are looking at us. See, God knows that when I come to him, and I present myself, my body, my whole self. Because you know what he says about the body? The body is the temple of God. Amen. That's where he dwells. See, we got this nice place. And you know, people build these beautiful churches. And they put all this money into them. And they want you to come in there and sit real still. And don't mess up nothing because you're going to mess up. Because this is the sanctuary. And this, was, this is the building where the church gathers. The sanctuary of God is in here. We talk about keeping the sanctuary clean and making sure the sanctuary is ready and making sure the sanctuary is right. It's not this. This is just a building that one day will fall apart. That somebody will either bulldoze it down or try to repair it or do whatever they got to do. God dwells in a clean heart. He dwells here. Right here. And he said, I can't dwell in a, in a, in a raggedy temple. I can't dwell in a place where I'm not welcome. And I'm not welcome if you have not surrendered yourself to me. If you've not given it over to me, I can't dwell there. 
And I do that when my mind is transformed and I realize I don't fit in this raggedy world. I'm passing through. And I, my prayer is that as I pass through, I leave a legacy of godliness in the places that I pass. But I'm not here to stay. So let me tell somebody today, please stop trying to fit in this here world. Because it ain't home. It's not. Don't worry about people talking about you. Don't worry because they say, well, you, you ain't even up on the latest trend. We don't even wear that kind of stuff no more. That's okay, baby, because it, it's still fit and I'm going to still wear it. Don't matter to me if it's, if it's in the trend or not. Because one thing I know about this world, the trend going to go around in a circle. It's coming back. And so, you know, why am I? Because see, this world, this world don't know what it's doing. And if you're trying to fit in and you're right in the middle, you don't know what you're doing either. I would rather go and consult God on what he says is right. Instead of consulting somebody who's in their own right has become a fashion guru and they telling me how I'm a, what, what I'm supposed to wear and what's going to work for me and what's going to make me look good. Because see, today they're going to tell me that and tomorrow they're going to tell me, you're looking ragged and you need to change that. So I got to let God transform me. And Paul says, when I am transformed, then I will learn to know what God's will is for me. And he talks about it's a good will, it's a pleasing will, it's a perfect will. I can't know the will of God for me when I'm thinking with the wrong mind. It's like I'm in another room and I'm trying to figure out what, where is God? And he over here and he's saying, you, you went somewhere else. I don't even know where you, you went off somewhere doing something different that I don't even want you to do because you won't come over here and find out what it is I want for you. You're running in circles. You're getting frustrated. I don't know what God wants for me. Why don't you allow him to transform your mind so he can show you clearly and you can see it. You can know it without a doubt. And when you know it, you will come to yourself and say, you know what, God's will is good for me. God's will is the best thing going for me. I, this, this right here, this works. Amen. God is awesome like that. He's a great God. He, he, he's a good daddy. And he loves you. But see, God said, my people, they can't compromise. Mm -mm. They have to be transformed. When we step over into the world and the customs of the world and the thinking of the world, we're compromising. And God said, not, no, 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 that's, that's, nope, that's not how we do this. What if God was a compromising God? You know? Well, what if he said, well, yeah, I think, yeah, I'll let you do that. He wouldn't be God anymore. We don't want a God that's compromised because that's fickle like us, wishy-washy. Don't know which way we're going to go. Today we're here, tomorrow we're here, next day we're over there. We're just all over the place. It's good to know our God is, is, is straight across the board and he doesn't change. And he said, my people cannot be people of compromise. You've been bought with a price. And I can just hear God saying, I paid the price. And so my will is what's going to be. And if you want to be walking in my will, then guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. And you are not going to be conformed to this world, but you're going to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So then you can understand, then you can know my good and perfect and pleasing will. You will walk in it. You will live it out. You'll be people that make your father proud. You'll be people that bring joy to your daddy's heart. We got to be transformed. Amen? Amen. Amen. I want to pray for us today. I always like to pray for us. Because I think we need to, we need some more transformation. What y'all think? Yeah. 
You want to be transformed this morning? You come on, let's pray together. Because see, we, we want to be people that give God us. Not a one-time thing, but a continuous sacrifice. That says, Lord, as I grow, as I change, I want you to have all of me, God. As I mature in Christ, I want you to have all of me, Father. Because I want to reflect you in the earth, the real you, God. Not, not, not what people, you know, because people got an idea of, of, about God. They don't know God. They got an idea of him. And unfortunately, it has been formed by some folk who are not living godly. But see, if, if, if we, we want to start it with us. We want to say, God, can you start with me? Yes, my little friend. Can you start with me, God? Help me to sacrifice me. It's going to cost me, God. And I might say, ouch, sometime. I might say, it hurts me sometime. But God, I'm willing to do it. I'm, I'm willing to give you me. As I think about, God, how much you have done in my life. As I think about, Lord, the sacrifices you made for me. It's the least I can do to give you me. And then God, I, I, you know, some of us, we got to confess, Lord, <laughs> I've been trying to fit in the world. I, I, I wouldn't say it like that, God, but I, as I look over my life, I'm, I'm seeing too much of the world in my life, God. And, and I want to make that cut. I want to make that, 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 that pulling away, God. And it hurts, Daddy, because I've been in the world a long time. And, and it, it is who I am. But I don't want to be like that anymore. Because I recognize today, Lord, I recognize today that I want to belong to you totally. I don't want to hold back. I want to be like Jesus. I want to be like Jesus. Sister Margaret, you go on and take a seat. I see you sitting, standing there. You don't have to try to stand. Yes. And then God, I confess to you today, I got some stinking thinking going on in my head. I'm thinking about the old ways, the old stuff I used to do and, and how much fun it was and, 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 and how come it can't work for me in this new life. And, and, and Daddy, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make it, I'm trying to bend it and fix it so that it fits. And I hear you saying, it doesn't fit, baby. Take it off. Let, let it go. I need to transform your mind. I need you to have a godly mind. I need you to process things through a godly mind. I need you to react to things through a godly mind. I need you to talk to people through a godly mind. I need you to deal with folks through a godly mindset. Not your old ways. I need to change you. I got to change you. And we stand before our Father today. We say, Dad, I'm surrendering me. Now can I tell you something? When you surrender, if you take your hands and you put them like this, you turn them up, that's, the, that's a surrendered posture. That's to say, Dad, I'm surrendering myself to you. Everything I've got, Lord, everything, God, my total self, I'm bringing it and I'm laying it on your altar, God. Like they used to bring the lambs and the bulls in the Old Testament and it would wipe away the sin and the brokenness. And so I lay myself, God, at your altar today. And I say, Father, would you accept me? Would you take my life, God, and make it acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord? I want to be used by you, Father. I want to go to the next step in you. I want to go deeper and I want to go higher. I want to be all about Jesus. It's not about me, God. It's all about you. And I need you, Lord. I've tried to do it on my own. I've tried to do it without surrendering. And it does not work. God, I bring myself. I give myself away. Take me, Lord. And then, Father, forgive me for trying to conform. Forgive me for trying to fit. Forgive me for trying to do what I used to do. Behave like I used to behave. Hold on to what I used to have in my life, Lord. Again, I surrender it to you. By giving you all of me. I give you all of me. And I say, Lord, forgive me and change me. 
Change how I think, God. Remind me that if I want to have a renewed way of thinking, it comes in the Word of God. The more I read the word, the more I meditate on the word, the more I study the word, I learn to think like a believer. I learn to behave like a follower of Christ. I won't learn it by magic. I got to look at it. I got to see it. I got to read it, Lord. I got to process it, God. I got to be honest about where I am, God. I got to stop playing the games and acting like I'm a super saint when I'm really not. I'm a babe in Christ and I want to grow up. And I do that by yielding myself to you. By reading your word, Lord. By coming together to fellowship, Lord, with the body. By saying, I need some help. Some of y'all around here, y'all pray with me. Y'all pray for me. Let's talk. Not gossip, but can we talk? The word says we must pray one for another. We confess our sins one to another. And we pray for each other. And we encourage one another. And we build each other up. That's what we're supposed to be doing. But we can't do it if we got baby minds. We got to mature in Christ. God, would you help us to be willing to hear correction, hear rebuke when it's needed, to not take it personally, to not have a chip on our shoulder, but say, Lord, I want to hear because I want to change. I want to be changed. And if I have to be shown myself, if somebody has to talk to me, somebody that I have faith in, somebody that has been sent by God to talk to me, Lord, help me to be open to hear me to be open to receive it into my heart and be changed for the better that's what we want God we want to be like Jesus and the more we grow up the more our minds are changed the more we become like Jesus who didn't mind being humble who endured pain and suffering sometimes who took it when folks lied on him and and, and tried to discourage him God help us because some of us can't take it. We're struggling with that, God. But help us to grow up in Christ. To mature in Christ. So again, we reflect you in the earth. That people will see us. And there will be a marked difference in us and in the world. They won't mistake us for somebody in the world. Because we'll be so different. Not, 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 not legalistic. Not prideful, but godly. Godliness. Holiness. Your word tells us to be holy as you are holy. Because you have called us to be holy. Father, have your way in us. Change us, God. Change us, God. Lord, maybe the people that are here, I just want you to say, change me, God. Change me, God. I want to be changed, God. I got to be changed. Have your way in us, Lord. Have your way in us, Lord. Amen. Can you give God some praise? Amen. 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 You can go to your seats, but you go changed. Amen. You go changed, amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.